First, thank you for the invitation, for the fabulous organization. I'm pretty sure you all agree with me. And uh, thank you, Saida, for uh, this kind invitation. So it's always tough to speak after Daniel, but it's always tough to speak about physical activity when you are in front of people dealing with uh, uh, dietary restriction and uh, dietary habits. So uh, I'm going to try to use my double background in exercise physiology and human nutrition. And, and first, I'll try to raise a couple of questions if I found how it works perfectly. Um, first, it's always tough to speak about physical activity because we all know or we all believe that we know what physical activity is. But actually, when I'm listening to all the, the lectures that are fantastic, obviously, but sometimes, you know, people are speaking about physical inactivity or sedentary behaviors or a lack of physical activity, but it's not the same thing at all from a physiological and behavioral point of view. And it does not have the same impact on our uh, dietary habits. So we have to be clear and consistent. It might be quite semantic, I agree, but this is important. So we'll try to have some clear definition together. And then I have also been asked to speak about the physical fitness impairment that we can um, see in obese kids. And finally, what are the first steps that the uh, European Childhood Obesity Group has recommended to practitioners? And when I mean practitioners, physical activity, it's not for exercise specialists. It's for everyone. It's for you, it's for families, it's for nurses, teachers, physical activity. I'm not dealing with adapted physical activity. I'm speaking about public health physical activity guidelines, which means that we all have to know what physical activity guidelines um, are. And then... Since we are in a nutrition eating behavior congress, I will speak about what I, I, I'm working on, um, thanks to my students, it, the interaction between physical activity, sedentary behaviors, and then uh, energy intake and appetite regulation, specifically in obese kids. So you might, th this might sound pretty simplistic, but actually this is important. What is physical activity? Physical activity is just any body movement that requires the use of your muscle and that will raise your energy expenditure above your resting energy expenditure. Basically, I could tell you using this definition that you are all doing physical activity right now because your energy expenditure is above your resting energy expenditure. But it's not that simple. So physical activity is only 20 to 25% to our daily energy expenditure. Most of the daily energy expenditure is um, thanks to resting metabolic rate. But it's also the most modifiable part of total energy expenditure. So this is really something we have to use to modify energy balance. This is not physical inactivity. Physical inactivity is the fact not to reach the recommendation. So this is very important. You can use whatever guidelines you want. If you don't reach them, you can be classified as inactive, okay? which is not a bad word. It's not that worse to be physical, physically inactive, but we have many things to do to make you active. And then please do not confound that with sedentary behaviors. Sedentary behaviors are all the activities that require a very, very small energy expenditure. And usually we use screen time and sitting time to assess uh, sedentary behaviors. So basically, from a semantic point of view, you're kind of doing physical activity, but you're at the same time doing sedentary behaviors. So if we, we really want to act on physical activity, if we really want to modify behaviors and energy expenditure, we have to be clear on those uh, definitions. So we have recommendations, we have guidelines. I'm just going to show you the uh, World Health Organization guidelines. Those are for kids, as you can see. Those are daily hours of physical activity. So to be classified as active, a kid under six has to get involved in about three hours of physical activity per day. And between five to 18, it's 60 minutes above 60% of, uh, well, I'd say, the intensity is moderate to vigorous, above 60% of its maximal capacities. So it's important to know that active transportation might be part of that. You know, um, Domestic activities like cleaning the house and so on might be part of the physical activity level and might help you reach recommendation and then be classified as 
active. And what is interesting is the fact that lately the Canadians have, have really put pressure to have uh, sedentary guidelines also, because now we know that sedentary behaviors and physical inactivity are not the same. So if you want, you can make someone active, but he might still have a very high level of sedentary behavior per day. So you want to fight both sides. So now we have also guidelines for sedentary time and it's less than an hour under six and it's less than two hours under uh, 18 years old. So this is important to have those guidelines, but obviously you can find that on, on Google or whatever. And we have more precise guidelines that have been developed as part of the uh, European Childhood Obesity Group ebook, as Daniel mentioned previously. So this is a free uh, ebook. So please go on our website and look at all the chapters. We have many, many chapters and you might find all the details with um, a lot of details regarding the intensity, the duration, examples of the activities you can propose to the kids and so on. So I'm not going to detail that here. So obviously we have recommendations. Doesn't mean that if you don't reach the recommendation, you're uh, facing health issues. It's better, obviously, to be classified as active. But then as someone said this morning, uh, what about people that are doing 50 minutes per day of physical activity? They are still inactive. Are you all doing 50 minutes per day of physical activity at 75% of your capacities? I'm not sure, actually. We all kind of inactive, okay? So we have to make sure that Please, one of the first steps when you are, we are practitioners is to assess physical activity. You can use questionnaires, it's fine. Okay, interviews, it's fine. Assess physical activity and we just have to make them improve their physical activity level. Please do not tell your patient, adults or kids, you have to be active, you have to reach the guidelines. The, the gap is too high for most of them. So step by step, and as you can see here, only... 15 minutes of um, additional physical activity at moderate intensity per day will have significant improvement on your mortality in both kids and adults. 15 minutes. It's not 60 minutes. It's 15 minutes. So this is a step-by-step -step process, and we really have to be clear uh, with that. So what about obese kids? So obviously, you will not be surprised to see that. Obese kids present a lower physical activity level compared to their normal weight peers. Uh, this is certainly the best study you can find. This is a very, very controlled study using accelerometers. And what uh, NG Page from Bristol UK did then was to assess the physical activity level using those accelerometers for seven days in obese and uh, lean adolescents. And what they found is that in blue, obese adolescents, whatever school days or weekend days, have a lower physical activity level. And one of the explanation is their lower physical fitness. I'm sorry. The lower physical fitness. Yeah, they have, this is a vicious cycle. They will have a lower physical fitness, then they will have a lower physical activity, but then in turn, they will have a lower fitness and so on. So our goal is to break this cycle. Excuse me. What is physical fitness? It's pretty simple. It's just our capability to perform all the daily activities without an excessive fatigue or perceived exertion. This is simple, okay? And we have many, many parameters uh, in physical fitness. You have obviously two main families, I'd say, cardiorespiratory fitness and then musculoskeletal fitness. So don't you worry, I'm not going to go through all those parameters. I'm just going to detail the main ones. And I'll start with cardiorespiratory fitness and specifically in obese children and adolescents. So when you use a lab-based evaluation of cardiorespiratory fitness, this is an incremental exercise. Most of the time we use a bike, okay, an ergocycle, because you don't want them to fall. So we use an ergocycle and we're going to ask them to uh, cycle until exhaustion. And then what you can see is that uh, the lower parts, it seems that obese kids and lean kids have the same VO2 and VO2 max, which means oxygen consumption capacity. But then if you look at the upper part, when you consider their body weight, 
And this is important because during daily activities, they have to carry their body weight. So we have to consider body weight when speaking about physical activity and physical fitness in those kids. And when you consider body weight, they have a lower aerobic capacity. So obviously, this is lab-based measurement. Doesn't mean that field testing are not reliable. And this study is a nice study showing that whatever the field test you're going to use, obese kids, and the, as you can see here, the higher is the weight status, and the lower are the aerobic capacities. Okay, so this is very important to, to see that considering their uh, body dimension, body weight, obese kids have a lower aerobic capacity. But there is um, something else that is very important, is the musculoskeletal capacity, because this is what we're going to use for our daily activities, when you want to grab a bottle, to climb stairs, and so on. So this is a very high determinant of autonomy. And what about um, muscle strength, basically? Those are muscle capacities, muscle strength. If you look here, absolute muscle strength with lab-based measurements, but with field testing, we would have the same results. Uh, obese kids, the upper part of the graph in gray, they have an absolute higher muscle strength. But once more, when you consider body weight, they have a lower muscle strength. Okay, I don't know if that's work. Okay, this was not the right one. Good. Okay, doesn't really work anyway on the screen. But then they have a lower muscle strength. And when you consider not body weight, but their fat-free mass or lean mass, the muscle itself, okay, what we can see is that you don't have any more differences. So apparently, lab-based measurement would say that they don't have any muscle strength impairment. Why? Just because they have the ability, and I think this is a key message when we want to treat people, and especially kids, they have the ability to adapt to their body weight. So they have the ability to have a better communication between their brain and their muscle and to recruit more muscle fibers. So basically, they produce a lower strength, absolute strength, the muscle itself. But then their, their brain is able to recruit more muscle units to produce the same strength as lean adolescents. And this is very interesting to see that they adapt to body weight because when you look at muscles that are not subject to the body weight, abductor pollicis, okay? You don't usually carry your weight with your abductor pollicis. You don't have any difference in terms of activation or strength. But then when you look at muscles like knee extensors, for instance, that are always carrying your weight, they will have to recruit more units to produce the same strength. Just that to, to tell you the fact that by the end of the day, they have a higher fatigue. So they are not able to produce the same number of repetition during exercise, for instance. So yes, they might produce the same strength, but it's because they can adapt their musculoskeletal system, but they will fatigue quicker. They will have higher fatigue. So the European Childhood Obesity Group, sorry, a couple of years ago, wrote a systematic review and concluded that when considering all those factors, the, physiopatho the physiopathology, sorry, the uh, field test, lab test, what we can say is that obese adolescents, as for cardiorespiratory fitness, they have a lower musculoskeletal fitness and muscle strength. And all the publications based on daily practice using field tests can show exactly the same thing. They have a lower uh, flexibility, agility, balance, and you can use whatever test you want. They will show lower musculoskeletal fitness. So this is a vicious cycle, as I told you, and our goal is to break this cycle, obviously. This is what proposed the European Childhood Obesity Group in the some recommendations to practitioners last year. And what we said is that, as I told you as an introduction, physical activity and physical fitness, we all have to deal with that. We don't have to be specialists. This is physical activity for health, okay? Not specialized or adapted physical activity. 
So we have to take information regarding their level of physical activity, regarding their sedentary behaviors, whether or not they are active or inactive. We don't want to make them active tomorrow, step by step. And at some point, you might have specialized that can help you to detect all the physical impairments. And then you can have a diagnosis. And this, and sorry for this diagnosis, you will have specialists in adapted physical activity, and they will be able to prescribe adapted programs. Okay? This is the paper I was um, talking about, the recommendation, the first steps that we think as the ECOG are the very first steps every practitioner, but also every teacher and so on, have to follow when it, they, they have an obese kid in front of them. So once you've diagnosed, diagnosed sorry, um, physical impairment, you'll address those kids uh, to specialists. And as we mentioned, we will have multidisciplinary treatments with adapted physical activity. And I'm not going to tell you that it doesn't work because it does. It does work very well. And um, you know that maybe better than I do. And physical activity and multidisciplinary weight loss programs, they will lead to better metabolic profile, body composition, body weight, health-related quality of life. Just something here. We are used to saying that if we lose weight, we're going to improve our health-related quality of life. No. It's through physical fitness. So the science is pretty clear now. To improve health-related quality of life, you have to improve fitness. And then you will, Im you will improve autonomy, daily activities, and then self-esteem, self-capacity, and then health-related quality of life. This is kind of important here. And then you will also have academic achievement. And then, as I told you um, as an introduction, I will finish with a couple of slides because you are all uh, interested in nutrition, eating habits, and it also help, uh, helps improve appetite control. Even though the very late studies are kind of... Um, I will invite you to go to the poster number 23 that deals with that. So, Indeed, a couple of publications in both adults and kids have said that... I'm, I'm not saying that dietary... Uh, counseling and the dietitian are, are not useful. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to replace you by physical activity, but um, some scientific paper are saying that, what about physical activity? Is it all about energy expenditure? Or is this also about energy intake? Can we, in a way, control energy intake by prescribing physical activity and physical exercise? You have all experienced that. When you go for a run, half an hour, an hour, an hour and a half, whatever, after you feel like hungry, not hungry, you want to eat chocolate or not, and so on. So exercise might impact your appetite. And we have to know that because most of the time we are saying that exercise or physical activity does not make us lose weight. Yes, because they, there are some compens compensatory mechanisms and sometimes you will increase your energy intake in response to exercise. That's why you're not losing weight. It's not the physiological effect of exercise itself. It's the implication on energy intake. And we have to consider that. And as Taylor rightly said in the 70s, there is a relationship between energy expenditure and energy intake. So as you can see here, the higher is your physical activity level and the better is regulated your appetite which is okay. You expend a lot of money, you can hit a lot, it's okay. But then this is a G-shaped curve and the lower is your physical activity level. The higher is your sedentary behavior level and the higher is going to be your energy intake also. So this is really tricky because we know now that as for adults, the physical activity level of obese adolescents is dramatically decreasing with time and with age. And their sedentary behaviors, the number of sedentary behaviors per day, but also the duration of each sedentary behaviors, it is dramatically increasing. So they are definitely in this non-regulated zone. Okay, very low expenditure, very high intake. And a couple of studies have shown that physical activity, when it's well-tailored, well-prescribed, 
might have a beneficial impact on energy intake. So even though those truly use self-reported energy intake, and as you said, Daniel, we know that the, most of the time the kids and parents under-report uh, energy intake using those methods. But then apparently, if you can use adapted physical activity, you can impact, as you can see at the bottom of the graph, some of the main gastropeptides or adipokines that are linked with uh, energy intake. So for instance, in response to physical activity induced weight loss or multidisciplinary intervention with physical activity, you will have a decrease in ghreline. Ghreline is the hunger hormone, you know, the one that makes you hit. So if you decrease the basal level of ghreline, you might affect appetite. And on the other side, you might increase your basal level of PYY, which is an anorexigenic peptide. So as you can see, exercise, physical activity, depending on its characteristic intensity, duration, and so on, might have the ability to modify also the physiology of appetite and energy intake. And this is definitely important. So this is the physiological part, but also this is what we do with Nicole Fianbach during her PhD and Chloe Schwartz. What we did is we looked at the brain activation in response to food cues. After exercise, the obese kids will decrease their activation. The, the, the brain will decrease their activation, which means the attention they will, it will give to food cues, visual food cues, pictures of food. And then they will decrease their energy intake. So basically, John Blundell proposed the model in, in adults. And, and to finish up, I'm not going to go into detail, but if, I'll be very happy to discuss that later if you need. So uh, we did adapt recently John Blundell's model uh, to obese kids. And indeed, physical activity, it's not all about energy expenditure. It's also about energy intake. And it will lead to modification of the physiological and neurocognitive control of energy intake. So there are still a lot, there is still a lot to do, but what we know is that energy, uh, physical activity, sorry, is not all about guidelines and public health physical activity, as I told you. It's also about intensity, frequency, modality, and then you can have very nice outcomes in terms of expenditure and intake. Thank you so much for your attention.